Today we are going to discuss something very interesting, which all of you I'm sure would have heard and read a lot about. This relates to the recent amendments that have been proposed for Section 56 uh, 27B of the Income Tax Act. Popularly, we know it as uh, Angel Tax. This amendment was proposed in this year's budget of 2023 to expand and widen the net of angel tax to also cover investments which are coming from uh, 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 foreign investors uh, for the shares which are issued by Indian closely held companies. Earlier, this is not a new provision as most of you would know because this is in the Income Tax Act since 1st April 2013 relating to assessment year 2013 and 14. Uh, the only difference is that for the last 11 years that this tax has been in existence, it was only applicable when Indian closely held companies used to issue shares to resident investors. It was to cover that ambit that this tax was introduced. The purpose and objective of introducing this tax was it was felt at that point in time that certain uh, unaccounted money was finding its way to closely held companies at valuation which was or uh, uh, at, at consideration which was even higher than its fair market value and that was escaping tax net therefore an amendment was proposed so that any investment which is made which is beyond the uh, fair market value of a share the excess over the uh, of, of over the fair, uh, fair market value was taxed as income from other sources. Now, this is an interesting case because this is on account of issuance of shares. As we see, issuance of shares is a capital transaction, is a capital receipt in the hands of the company receiving the investments and incomes which are derived from other sources are generally your revenue receipt. So this is an instance where the premium which is received over and above the fair market value of the shares, which actually is a capital receipt, is within the tax net. But this has been for the last uh, 10 years now. So what has changed now? The angel tax which has been amended is to now bring within the ambit not only the Indian uh, residents who are issued shares by closely held companies in India, but also uh, foreign investors. As we know, a lot of inbound investments are happening in India. There is equity capital. There are convertible securities. So far, this, this uh, tax was not applicable to shares which were issued to non-residents. But effective 1st of April this year, this has been brought, brought into the ambit of angel tax, which is why this has assumed great importance for all of us, because especially uh, lawyers and consultants and clients and companies who are working and advising foreign investments, and especially all the PE funds and VC funds who uh, send a lot of funds to India will definitely be impacted by this. So we thought that we need good discussions on this and for which we thought a webinar like this is important. So Kumar and I are going, are going to cover a lot of aspects as we go along today, broadly about angel tax. So we would see what are the various valuation norms which have been proposed, the rules which are out, the safe harbor provisions that are introduced. There are certain kinds of entities which will invest in these Indian closely held companies, but from certain specified countries, they have been specifically exempted. Uh, the interplay of these uh, provisions with the FEMA regulations, because in any foreign investment coming into India, the FEMA provisions can never be ignored. So what is the interplay between these regulations and FEMA regulations? And of course, it's Still early days to say anything, but we've already identified certain critical issues and key considerations, which, which definitely as we go along will pose uh, problems and challenges. And then we have to see how the, the final uh, law emerges in this. So to broadly cover all these aspects, we thought we'll share our perspective. And uh, I have, as I said, Kumar with me. Kumar is our uh, partner for, of tax. Therefore, I will now hand over to you, Kumar. You can share your insights and perspective on this very, very important development. Sure. Thank you, Lalit. And good morning, uh, rather good afternoon to everyone. Yeah. Are the slides visible? I just, uh, just wanted to add, Kumar, big pardon. I just wanted to add one for the 
participants benefit. Uh, so the way we have designed this uh, webinar is that you can ask your questions. There is a Q&A box. You can post your questions anytime during the presentation. Uh, but for ease of uh, reference and ease of conduct of this webinar, we will take all your questions at the end. Sorry, Kumar, go ahead. Sure. So at the outset, I think let's understand uh, the whole uh, you know, scope as to how this provision applies and what does it fit. Uh, while we all call it angel tax and angel tax was kind of coined, uh, the term was coined thinking that, you know, the entities that are receiving the investments are essentially receiving these investments, not because they deserved it, but because there was a benevolent investor who would put in a little more than what uh, they deserve. Now, the reality is that this may not be true because uh, it's an investing is a commercial decision. And in all likelihood, if, if there are unrelated parties. There is no, uh, you know, benevolent gesture by the investor. It is essentially the commercial or the prospect of the business doing well that would make the investment do well. Now, uh, what happened here is that in uh, from assessment year 2013-14, uh, that is with effect of April 1, 2013, uh, typically uh, you will not find that uh, a capital which is received by one party from another is taxed. But here is a made here is a new provision that came in where it says that if you are receiving any money from a, a non-resident investor in the form of uh, the share uh, subscription amount, and if the recipient is a closely held company, and a closely held company here would be a company which is kind of not owned by the government and which is not a subsidiary of a public company or a listed entity, not public company but a listed entity. And uh, that is that we define here in a very broad terms as a closely held, uh, held company. If a CHC were to receive any consideration for issues of shares from it was earlier any per, you know it was earlier only residents now it is any person uh, and that exceeds the face value of the shares. The difference between the aggregate consideration received for the issuance and the fair market value of such shares is taxed in the hands of the company as income from other sources. So, so far, three important points. One, it applies only to a closely held company. Second, it applies only if uh, the, the consideration that is received is in excess of the face value. And the third, the difference between the, the consideration received and the fair market value will be subject to tax. And it will be taxes income from other sources. Uh, an Indian entity today is 25.17% uh, is the tax rate on it. It could also be subject to tax at 30% or whatever. But basically what we're talking about is an excess premium, if it is received, will be subject to tax at 25%. Very interestingly, there are two, uh, two additional gateways that were created for exempting certain you know, entities. And this provision was not applicable where the issuance of shares was made to and the consideration is received by a certain category of investors. The first being where a private unlisted company and typically regarded as a venture capital undertaking is receiving this money from a venture capital company or a venture capital fund or a category one or category two uh, AIF, which is regulated by SEBI or for that matter under the IFSC fund management regulations. So that's one gateway out. Or exemption. The other exemption is for the class of persons that may be notified by the central government. And here, the startups were notified in 2018, and then some tweaks were made in 2019, uh, where these startups are to be recognized by DPIT. You know, we'll discuss this in slightly more detail in the next slide. But broadly, uh, we have seen so far that there is a charge. The charge is not applicable on two categories which are exempted. And one of them is the DPIIT registered startups. Now, this particular uh, exemption is available for uh, a startup that is registered with uh, DPIIT uh, that has a share capital in the premium not in excess of 25 crores. And uh, whether a non resident or an EIF or a venture capital fund, if they were to invest into this entity, that part of the capital is not uh, counted. Now, when uh, and then this particular entity, there are certain other stringent conditions also that it can't invest in certain specified assets. It can't give certain loans. It can't uh, buy certain motor vehicles. 
Uh, it can't, uh, you know, invest in the real estate. And then there are so on and so forth. There are uh, there is a long list of, uh, you know, no-go uh, areas where it can't uh, put in the money. And this kind of made it a very stringent condition. And uh, historically, what we've seen is that not too many startups, in a way, uh, were able to take benefit of this provision. Nevertheless, uh, the government has now extended this uh, particular exemption uh, also to investments from non-residents, which are received by these startups, which qualify uh, in what we call as uh, Section 4 of, uh, rather Clause 4 of the 2019 uh, notification, which lists down all these conditions. So as we go back and see, there are two categories here. The first is VCA, uh, VCFs uh, and uh, AIFs, and the second is the government notified entities. In the category of the government notified, notified entities, we have now a new entrant, user of entities. So on 24th of May, the government has uh, notified essentially three classes of non-resident investors who will be, uh, you know, when, when an Indian entity receives, or rather a closely held company receives investments from these exempted category investors, then uh, the angel tax provisions will not be applicable to such investments. The first one being the government and the government-related investors, such as central banks, sovereign wealth funds, and uh, you know other entities which are multilateral or international jurisdictions. You know entities which are from international jurisdiction and multilateral multilateral organizations like IFC and all that, or a world bank, or where the direct or indirect ownership of the of the government is is at seventy-five percent or more. So effectively, uh, in a way, whether it's Indian or the foreign government, but uh, these are the kind of uh, investors who will enjoy this uh, exemption. Second is the banks or the entities involved in the insurance business, where they are regulated under the respective laws uh, in their home countries. The third is there are four broad-based uh, sort of investors who are coming in from uh, 20 odd companies, countries. And uh, these are all, uh, you can say that they are developed uh, market countries. And these are entities registered with SEBI as the category one FPI. Uh, the endowment funds associated with the university, hospitals, or charities. Pension funds created or established under the law of the foreign country. And broad based pool investment vehicles, the funds where the number of investors in such a vehicle or a fund is more than 50. And such fund is not a hedge fund or a fund which employs diverse or complex trading strategies. So to put it clearly, they are essentially saying that, look, if you're a government-owned entity or if you're a bank or an insurance because you're regulated, you can't obviously invest and you can't be, in a way, uh, the vehicle for, uh, you know, in a way, uh, moving in money as money laundering or whatever. And if you are one of these four category investors who are essentially bona fide investors and you're coming in from certain jurisdictions, then you're exempted. Mind you that uh, this uh, exemption notification has come from May 12, May 24, 2023. And uh, we don't know whether the investments that were made prior to that will enjoy this benefit or not. And we'll discuss about it a little more later. Before we discuss uh, what the new changes or the tweaks in the valuation norms are, we should also look at what was there so that uh, our audiences here should be able to appreciate what they had and what is going to be the, the new norms. So as of uh, you know last year, the norms were that for unlisted equity shares, the, the taxpayer had an option, the company had an option to get the valuation done as per net asset value method or discounted free clear cash flow method. And the discounted free cash flow method was supposed to be certified by a merchant, merchant member. And if the valuation is justified by that, then there was no injury tax on that. In case of uh, convertible instruments like CCPS or compulsorily convertible preference shares, uh, the valuation says, uh, the norm says that it is the price which is fetched in the open market. And uh, there ought to be a valuation report supporting that, it be it from a merchant banker or a charter accountant. All that is fine, but it ought to be a price which is fetched in the open market on the valuation data. 
So these were the two categories of uh, valuations that were prescribed. There is a residual clause also, which basically says that, look, if you're not able to justify this, but if you are able to substantiate the valuation to the satisfaction of the income tax officer, based on the value on the date of the issuance of shares uh, and the value ought to be of the assets, and this, this could include the intangible assets, because typically uh, in, uh, uh, an intangible asset that is, um, uh, that is created by the company itself may not find its place in the, in the books, but it is nevertheless valuable. So the idea was that if you are able to show to the officer the value and substantiate that, even that would be fine. Now let's look at this. As to what is it that they're saying now? Uh, while uh, the stated objective of this entire exercise is that they want to bring the parity between now non-resident and the resident investors, but there is still no parity between the two as far as what are the methods that they can rely on when it comes to valuation. So going forward, we will have, and this is a draft tool right now, which is subject to uh, the open uh, discussion and, uh, and the suggestions until June 5th. And it basically says that the resident investors can choose four methods. The non-resident investors can choose five, five categories or rather benchmarks. And the first four, which are available to the resident investors are, the old, the first two old ones, the, the net asset value method of the DCF, as it was already there. Uh, the, the, you know, method C and E are essentially a new concept introduced where they're saying that, look, the two exempted category investors, one being the AIFs and the, you know, IFSE fund, if they have invested at a certain price, to the extent such an investor has invested at that price, you can also get an investment from any other investor who's, who's a resident at the same price. And that would be considered kosher, will not lead to the taxation. Similarly, if there's a non-resident investor who's exempted, and if you get the equivalent bond of the investment from any other investor, then even that is fine. While these methods are there available for residents, they are also available to the non-residents. In addition, the non-residents can also opt to go to a merchant banker and who can determine the valuation on the basis of another five different methods. And these are the comparable company multiple method, the probability weighted expected return method, the option pricing method, the milestone analysis method, or replacement cost method. So essentially, uh, the non-residents have five ways to defend and maybe five plus five another in a, in a way, nine ways here because the method D leads to five different methods. And uh, the residents have the four ways to defend the valuation. Uh, we also have what is called now as a safe harbor provision. Okay. What it effectively says is that if you have, in case of a resident, obtained a valuation by NAV or DCF, and in case of a non-resident, if you have obtained the valuation by these two methods, plus any of the other methods that are, you know, uh, utilized by the merchant banker to rely on for deriving the valuation, then a 10% margin would also be available. So what it means is that uh, if there is another investor who invests within 90 days uh, of that particular, uh, you know, valuation, and the valuation, uh, the, the subscription price does not change by more than 10%. That should be fine. Uh, they've also, uh, you know, looked at uh, one of the key issues that, uh, you know, everyone has been uh, browsing about. The valuation date for all uh, practical purposes here was a date on which the consideration was received. But typically you will never have uh, a valuation available right on the day on which you get the money because even to get the money, you need to get the valuation for it. So that valuation report now is allowed within 90 days window. And that's a very welcome step. As we discussed the price matching concept just a while ago, uh, the, the draft rules also have an illustration. And this illustration says that if a private unlisted company receives a consideration of rupees uh, 50,000 from a venture capital company or a fund or AIF, for issue of 100 shares at the rate of 500 per share, then such a company can issue 100 shares at this rate 
to any other investor within a period of 90 days of the receipt of consideration from venture capital company. Now, while they've given this uh, you know, analogy, uh, they have not given similar analogy for the, the price matching concept where the investment has actually come from a non resident investor who's now in exempted category. But we can, you know, kind of assume that uh, if they've given it once, the same you know, method can be applied there as well. Uh, I would request Lalit to talk about uh, the interplay with FEMA and the valuation uh, norms here. Thank you, Kumar. So one important development is how the new angel tax will interplay with FEMA regulation. Because the most important aspect of this angel tax is that it is now going to be applicable for shares which are issued to non-residents. So for the for foreign investment uh, regulations, the NDI uh, rules of 2019, there is already a pricing mechanism. So the price, the fair market value of shares which are issued to non-resident becomes the minimum at which the investment must happen if the shares are issued to an overseas investor. Now, the problem here is, in fact, there is no contradiction. The problem here is that while uh, the new angel tax provisions propose for various valuation methods, Kumar just mentioned five additional methods which will be given to them in addition to the two methods which are for domestic investors. FEMA does not have any, any prescribed method. All that the FEMA regulations say that the valuation must be done by internationally accepted principles of valuation. So, so far, so good. There is no disconnect. However, now for the purposes of matching the two uh, laws and two provisions, the, you know, the investments made by foreign investors will also be valued by using all these additional methods. And of course, when all these documents get filed with the authorized bankers and say eventually Reserve Bank of India to record and report the foreign investment, uh, not, uh, not it's unlikely, but could be issues around how this investment has or how this valuation has happened. So I would not say that there is a disconnect, but we'll have to figure out how the two rules interplay. Another important thing we feel is that uh, currently the proposed rules and the way angel tax provisions have been written, they only cover the unlisted securities of closely held Indian companies, but they do not clearly cover and do not clearly uh, uh, prescribe for convertible securities. There is something is silent, not clear. So for foreign investment, I think those who work on this in this space they know that the most important instrument generally is not equity because the private equity investors and VC fund, in order to have a preferred uh, preference over other investors, choose a convertible security, generally a preference shares, a compulsorily convertible preference shares. So if the instrument used in FEMA is CCPS, to which the norms and valuation norms are not clear how they will apply uh, under the new angel tax regime, there could be some uh, disconnect between the two. We are hopeful that uh, when, because these are all draft rules and they are out for public comments and the industry and other affected uh, institutions and persons are free to write to the government and many submissions have already been made. So 5th June is the day when public comments can be given. And we are hopeful that this particular issue will be addressed and this will also extend to convertible securities such that the FEMA and angel tax provisions do not conflict with each other. I would also like to highlight one important issue, which is also related to this safe harbor provision of 10%. Uh, this safe harbor provision has allowed that the variation between the issue price and the fair market value, the acceptable norm is 10%. To take an example, if the fair market value done by one of these methods described is say 100 rupees and the shares are issued at say 109 rupees there being a difference of nine percent this is acceptable which means there will be no angel tax on this nine rupee under section 56 um, uh, 2670b so this safe harbor provision allows this variation so that it is not taxed 
typically in uh, we have seen in our experience that most uh, foreign investment transactions are with investors who would like to have certain rights in uh, uh, in in their uh, uh, shareholders agreement uh, anti dilution if you are aware of what anti dilution right is in an anti dilution right uh, shares are issued to foreign investor with a right given to the foreign investor investor that if in future certain shares are issued at a price less than the price of the shares issued to them they will be given additional shares so that they are they are not diluted so these provisions are quite common now if anti dilution rights have to be enforced which will mean that uh, shares further shares will have to be issued to foreign investor the way they used to do this is through their conversion ratio so they used to adjust their conversion ratio instead of a say one is to one conversion ratio they would they would modify it to one is to one uh, and get additional shares for that for them now uh, the fema law doesn't allow the pricing of the shares to be less than the fair market value so typically what will happen the room that is left to change this conversion ratio is only to the extent of 10% because beyond this what will happen is that the indian company will get subject to tax so what we feel in our experience and which is what some representations have also been made that this safe harbor provision should be of a higher limit not 10% could be 20% could be 25% because this will help foreign investors to even uh, uh structure their investment and enforce their standard rights of anti dilution and even when corporate actions like additional bonus shares or uh, consolidation and subdivision of shares happen all of this is adjusted through the conversion mechanism but if after conversion mechanism being implemented if the price of the share uh, uh, you know is is falls below the fmv then then that is not allowed under fema and in order to have the room to do this adjustment that delta which generally is 20 25% to maneuver things is not possible now so what we feel is that uh, you know it's early days but if all these concerns are not addressed then it could to some extent affect the way we are doing our foreign investment transactions particularly with with investors who have these kinds of uh, uh, standard shareholders right uh, for their investment kumar over to you now sure thank you lalit so let's look at uh, what we uh, in a way have identified the broader and critical issues. So one of them, uh, Lalit has already discussed on the adequacy of the 10% safe harbor limit for enforcing anti-dilution rights. The other issues essentially are that the broader category of the methods are not available to the recent investors. Now, what happens is that uh, in a in a same round, if there is a non-resident as, well as, as well as a resident investor, then does it mean that one needs to justify the valuation using two different methods? Now that kind of adds the complexity for the company because typically it is the company which is required to get these valuations done, right? The second one is uh, there is no uh, safe harbor or pricing match price matching benefit for the shares under the unlisted equity shares, which are uh, convertibles such as CCPS. So the valuation norms for the CCPS is still the same, which is essentially. The, the price at which it would fetch on the valuation date, uh, on the, which is, uh, you know, the date of uh, subscription. Now, if there is no, uh, no, no way to get, get any, uh, leeway there, then your anti dilution rights would again, uh, be affected because of that. The third one is, uh, the India has been receiving major investments and that's been a historical trend. Uh, from Singapore, Mauritius, and Netherlands. And they have not been included in the list of specified countries for notified exempted classes. So uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there are there are no investors who may have presence through these entities and who may not have actually a global presence through US in, in US or other entities, uh, other countries. But uh, essentially what we're saying is that uh, the key investing uh, countries are, are out of the uh, list. Uh, a very important point uh, which we have noted is that the broad-based funds exemption uh, requires at least 50 or more investors to qual qualify for the exemption. 
Now, if there's an investment through an SPV or a you know other set of feeder funds, you may not actually have uh, you know the entity which is investing qualify for this particular exemption. So there is a bit of uh, you know lack of clarity here. And uh, while we are going to write uh, with all these uh, critical issues uh, before fifth of June, uh, hopefully some of these will also get uh, clarified. Now uh, there is also a bit of uh, you know, lack of clarity as to whether the price matching, where there's an AIF which is invested and where is an exempted non-resident is invested, to what extent is it available? Is it only to one or is it to both? And uh, in a way, uh, can one club it? So one doesn't really know uh, if, uh, you know, how will this kind of play out? Now we'll have a, you know, this is open for question and answers. Maybe I can stop uh, this here and we can have uh, the participants ask the questions. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're free to, I think we have a few questions here which Kumar can take up. You can still put your questions here because uh, we don't have a facility of people uh, speaking and uh, raising their questions. So, we request if you could post your question in the Q&A box. We will read and then we will respond to them. I can see a few there. Uh, Kumar, you can take those up, please. So one of the questions is, uh, what if the investors refuse to provide relevant information to the company for submission to the tax authority? Now, remember the valuation here is, uh, is the company's responsibility, the information that is to be given for valuation, uh, which uh, is all in the control of the company. So as far as valuation is concerned, it's all in the control of the company. Now let's look at what is the information which comes, uh, you know, when it comes to the exemption of the investors themselves. Now, if the investor uh, gives the information and the company is confident of uh, that information being correct, then there is no issue. In any case, uh, you know, now obviously you have, an, you know, uh, the beneficial ownership norms which are available uh, under the company's act. So to some extent, that information in any case will be required, right? Dalit, do you want to, you know, talk about uh, if there is an investor who does not want to give information, what can be the issue? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, you know, uh, all the provisions and all laws, whether it is FEMA or whether it is Income Tax Act, I mean, in any investigation or any cause notice which is served on you, you are bound to provide the information. And similarly, I mean, there have been cases where some kind of information, especially say with even law firms, when we have been asked or some other law firms and professionals are asked, they cite even reasons as uh, attorney-client privilege. But when it is a regulatory intervention and an information is sought, and especially for, uh, you know, uh, tax laws, I mean, when when, you know, there is a GAR and then there are other provisions, I am sure it would not be a good idea to not share the information, especially when uh, getting the beneficial owner, details of beneficial owner and other disclosures which are becoming the norm. So Kumar, I think, I feel that uh, if the information, it's a good question, but if the information has been sought uh, and is denied, I think then, then, it's not only about angel tax and then, then the general law of income tax will apply that suppression of information and documents not given when asked. So I think the second question is why the date is mentioned as applicable from 1st of April 2023. So uh, very, very good question. Very minute observation, it seems this is. Uh, you see, uh, the notification came on 24th of May of 2023. And this is uh, pertaining to uh, to the the question on applicability of the uh, of the exemption provision for startups, where the money is received from the non residents Now, the notification itself says that notification shall be deemed to have come into force from the first day of April two thousand twenty-three. So there is a clarity there, where it's now applicable to that. The Third question is. Kumar, if I can add, just uh, bear with me, please. I can, if you can, I mean, if I can add here, 
Each a other. notification which also came because this is also one of the questions that's been raised that the one that you mentioned is about the startups, the DPIITs uh, recognition to startups, they are exempted. The other notification which had the exempted categories of investors from the specified countries, that list of 21 countries, I think that has also come sometime later in May, right? While the law has come into force from 1st April, I think if this concern is raised uh, with the uh, with the with the CBDT or relevant department, I think they'll clarify. For all intent and purposes, this law has come into force on the first of April this year. So any anything which is happening or investment which has come and is being issued and which otherwise fulfills the conditions of this this uh, section, uh, I feel the the tax would get applicable. But but as I said earlier. These are very early days and some of things are not clear, but, but sooner or later clarifications and notifications will come to clarify something which is concerning. One of the questions is essentially, is there a way we can get the tax free investment from Singapore, Mauritius and enlisted companies? Now, mind you that uh, the exemption lists do not have these countries, right? But if your investment meets the valuation norms, then obviously irrespective of where are you coming from, that is fine, absolutely fine. In, in fact, uh, I, I, I like to add here uh, because this is this is too early to, to close which countries. The notification mentions 21 and as Kumar mentioned, all important jurisdictions from where funds generally come is Mauritius, Singapore, the Netherlands, even Cayman Island. Some of these jurisdictions are not even there as if, you know, so representations have already been made. Various bodies are making this as uh, as a representation to the government to relook at that list and expand that list because, as Kumar earlier mentioned, the kinds of countries which are mentioned are already very developed countries, and I don't think so. Even in our transactions and M&A deals, funds and investment comes from those jurisdictions. So therefore, these are all financial jurisdiction, say about Singapore and Mauritius, they have their own challenges, but but hopefully some of these entry, uh, 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 countries will will or may get eventually added also. So there is also a request to share the presentation with uh, the participants here. And uh, so we have done one uh, JSA prism, which is a document which essentially covers this in greater detail. We, we should certainly be able to share that with you. Uh, as far as you know, this presentation is concerned. Please remember that this is based on the draft rules, and we'll probably have uh, uh, you know the final rules coming in in another 10, 15 days, and we certainly want to update this and uh, share it with the uh, with the audiences. Yeah. Well, I can see there's one more question also there. Oh, it says so a couple of more questions. So one of them it says that even if the investment comes from the U.S. fund. There could be investors from different geographies pulled at US fund level. Does that mean investor level details of the fund will be examined to get exemption? No, I think this is the fund which uh, ought to be a broad based fund and it ought to be registered or coming in from a country which is one of those, uh, you know, listed ones and US is one of them. So it should be fine. I don't think, uh, you know, the, the income tax notification talks about investor level details of the US funds. Now, there is one more question here, which essentially says that whether there is any change in the status of the startup company, if there is a change in the shareholding from the individual promoter to the company's new investor. Now, I haven't really been able to really get the hang of this question. Maybe you can clarify this a little bit more. Uh, Kumar, I think uh, uh, the question is that uh, because the exemption is to a startup, which is defined and recognized by DPIIT's circular. And it has a test, a few tests given there. So yeah. I think the question is that if the individual promoters who originally started the company, mm -hmm. if they change their shareholding and transfer the shareholding to another corporate entity, would the exemption be lost and the status will change from a startup to a normal or a non-startup entity? I think that's the... That's the question. If yeah. if I didn't understand, I think the the participant has even clarified. Uh, yes, it's correctly. Yeah, yes, that's 
Yes, sir. Correctly analyzed. I think, yeah, that's what the question is. So, uh, if you really see the, the conditions that are given in the 2019 notification, do not have any change of equity clause, right? So, it just says that you ought to be uh, having 25 crores capital. And uh, this, this ought to come from a certain set of uh, investors. And then there are conditions of uh, not investing in in the real estate, in loans, in, in the, you know, motor vehicles and a couple of other things. So uh, maybe we can hear on this as to a specific condition and all, or what is the reason, real reason why uh, this is a, an issue which is bothering participant here. We can take it offline, but I don't really uh, think there is anything which kind of prohibits it. I think that too, Kumar. I think there is there is nothing like that. Uh, the startup conditions, as you said, are not dependent on who the shareholder is or upon the change of shareholding. But happy to look at it because it's a long list of what, what are the conditions, eligibility conditions of a startup turnover, capital, year of existence, shouldn't be more than 10 years. So if one meets all those conditions, whether that's been held originally by individual or later on transferred to a corporate entity, shouldn't change the status. But happy to look at it and you know, we can... As Kumar said, discuss that offline if you want. Uh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, we're happy to, you know, we still have a few minutes left for this webinar. Happy to take those. So if there are none, I think uh, we can go ahead and uh, close. Yeah, I think there is, there are no more questions. I mean, this is a very, very controversial new topic. Uh, uh, I think the questions will follow as because we have also in a span of last month, month and a half been given so many uh, draft rules, notification, proposal. And I think this is this is an evolving subject. Uh, I'm sure that because there will be a lot of questions as the law evolves, as is true with income tax or for that matter, any law. This is going to be uh, some game changer because it's going to affect positively, negatively, some foreign investments because everyone is not happy about it because although the tax is on the company, not on the investor, yet no investor would like when they invest the share price or the higher share price that they pay over the fair market value, their investing company gets subjected to tax. And therefore, they would be, they look for exemptions, they will write to government, make representations and get as much as possible so that the company doesn't get taxed. But uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for taking out your time. And it's been a good session. As Kumar said, we will be sharing a copy of this presentation with everyone and a JSA prison that we had prepared uh, on, on this subject. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, have a good evening and have a very nice weekend ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you.